Okay, let's give an applause to Eric, who will be talking about strings. All right. Oh, wonderful. Uh, buenos dias, que tal? I've been practicing that all week. Um, uh, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, it's great to uh, be able to speak with you all today. Um, so uh, let me give you a uh, quick preview about what is about to happen in the next 20 minutes or so. So uh, I'm going to start with a very simple question. Uh, then I'm going to propose a solution and highlight an open source library that I think everyone here should be using or something equivalent. And then I'm going to end in chaos. So let's start with this simple question. Okay, where do you put your strings? Everyone in this room has probably had to answer this question at some point. Now, um, uh, the platform that you use, uh, whether it's uh, Apple, iOS, Android, uh, offers some kind of answer uh, to this question. But, um, you know, I would submit that as your code base grows over time, uh, you'll find that you've maybe not uh, answered this question correctly. Um, I'd also ask all of you, once you've put your strings someplace, how do you actually use them in code? How do you reference them in code? Um, and the answer in this room is probably some form of NS localized string. Uh, you know, what's the big deal? What's this talk even about? But um, I can tell you that there are other choices that you can make that will make your life much easier as your project scales. But who am I? Who am I? So, my name is Eric Silverberg. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Perry Street Software. Uh, we publish two of the largest LGBTQ plus uh, dating apps on iOS and Android, Scruff and Jacked. Uh, our, our app has been downloaded, I think, close to 40 million times at this point. Um, our app has been localized since 2011. Uh, we are in 16 languages today. Uh, our company has a team of uh, more than 3,000 developers. We have more than 600 modules, and I started compiling our app on Monday, and it still hasn't finished. Right, that's that a joke. That was a joke. That's a, I'm kidding. There's six of us. We're all here today. Uh, the iOS team, six developers. Uh, we have about, I think, maybe 30 uh, on our product team now. Um, and we think a lot about uh, architecture, about design. Um, but, you know, I, I'd say because we're a smaller team, we rely um, perhaps more heavily on the open source community uh, to keep our projects moving forward. Okay, but before we go any further, let's, let's do a brief history lesson, all right? The, the history of localization. So, in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, you probably had your strings written directly in your source code, right? This is a very uh, common piece of Objective-C. We've got a, probably a, a UI label here. You can tell it's Objective-C because that semicolon at the end and all those weird at signs everywhere. Um, and so, uh, you know, it seems simple enough. It's, you know, not a big deal until suddenly you just have strings everywhere, okay, all over your code base. So now what do you do? Well, uh, many of you, if you're familiar with this era, you probably ran gen strings, right? This was a script uh, that Apple provides, and um, uh, that, uh, when run over your code base, would create a large uh, localized dot strings file, okay? And uh, this is going to tell you how old I am. Uh, originally, this file was formed. Does anyone know what format that file was? Couldn't hear, I couldn't quite hear that. But 
if you guessed UTF-8, you would be correct after the year, I think, 2014. But before that, uh, it was formatted in UTF-16, OK? which was a format that Apple seemed to think was a good idea that caused no amount of uh, problems and conflicts back in, uh, in the early days. Um, so uh, anyway, but you know, still, it's fine. We have a big file, uh, localized strings file. You know, uh, what, what's the problem? Well, um, uh, you know, eventually, your localized strings file will be this giant bag of strings, right? And um, you know, I would submit that there are three key problems with this, uh, with this file. Uh, the first is organization, OK? It's very difficult to understand what strings do I have and what strings do I need. And because of that organizational challenge, um, you have a second problem, which is consistency. OK, you have casing, uh, you have tenses. Um, uh, you know, you, people potentially use um, many different formats for their keys. And that's the final problem that I would submit. Um, it's very difficult to determine if a uh, key is missing, if a string is missing from this file. You know, so one solution that would be the most obvious um, is to create uh, multiple files for better organization, OK? So uh, you can maybe have a big legacy file, your old localizable, and then let's make some new strings files, right? Awesome. We'll have one for errors, you know, maybe different feature modules. Um, uh, great. Um, but but um, you still haven't solved the problem of referencing non-existent strings. And you know, I would submit there's there's one big file um, with or big well, there's one big problem with using multiple files, which is you have to then specify the file name in that table name argument uh, every single time, um, and this means you have a lot of boilerplate, a lot of repeated code. Okay, and as developers, we hate repeating ourselves. Um, so let me take a big step back. Uh, and ask one more time, where do you put your strings? It is 2022 now, OK? And all the code samples that I just showed you were for a pre-Swift UI, you know, UI kit imperative world. That world is gone, OK? That world is over. Um, so. Let me, ask, uh, let me ask again, how many of you um, uh, put your strings? This is an honest question. How many of you put your strings uh, in your main app target, right? The main application. Probably a pretty common uh, design choice. Um, so, and it works. You know, before the Swift UI world, it's fine. It's no problem. You can, you can reference them with NS localized string. But uh, then SwiftUI came out a few years ago, and we were all super excited to start using it. And you were super excited for the potential for live previews. You know, Interface Builder was pretty good. Um, but we would get these like live dynamic previews, no more of this XML nonsense. So um, you probably opened up you know, Xcode 11, the very <laughs> first version of SwiftUI. And uh, what did you see? OK, you built a simple demo Swift UI view. What did you see? Well, you probably saw this. And then you waited a little bit longer, and then you saw this. And then you waited a little bit longer, and you saw this. And then you waited another 60 seconds, and you saw this. And then two minutes goes by, and then you get this. Right? You're all laughing. So uh, I think we've probably all seen screens like this um, more often than we care to count and why SwiftUI is so fragile, OK? And with leg large legacy projects, which it sounds like many of us are working on, um, it does not work. It's just, it's, it, it, we, the, um, uh, from our friends at Uber before, you know, they even described, we've got to use a whole separate uh, project to, to build our, um, uh, our SwiftUI components. So I would submit that uh, instead of putting your strings uh, in the, the standard default place, the main uh, app target, 
we should put our strings in a different component, in a different Swift package, perhaps something like this, UI components, OK? And if you do that, if you pull all your strings out of the main project, put them in a package, you can do something like this, which is create a yet another separate Swift package, um, much smaller to compile. In this demo app, you can see it's, I called it the, the features package. And as a result, you will get faster, more reliable previews. Essentially, what, I've, uh, what I'm describing here, what I'm proposing here, is that uh, you, you can build that demo app, so to speak, in your actual uh, main, uh, uh, main workspace by creating uh, smaller Swift packages. Um, and all this to say uh, is that architecture matters. Okay? The question, where do you put your strings, um, is actually just a, a small question in the larger philosophical debate about architecture. Okay? Having a uh, single monolithic app, uh, single monolithic target, is an anti-pattern for many, many reasons, uh, including UI previews with Swift UI. Okay, I would also submit to you all, you do not need a specialized build system to, uh, or you, you also don't even need to be fighting with Xcode to create these kinds of multi-module apps. Swift packages, Swift package manager, uh, has advanced substantially over the past four years, okay? Um, and I think it's probably much simpler than anything that has come before it. Um, and I would also argue that Swift packages are definitely ready for prime time. Uh, and, and our company certainly uh, does take advantage of it. So, um, our uh, MVA has 10 layers. I actually just learned this word at dinner the other night. Um, minimum viable architecture, okay? Uh, so, we have 10 layers. And I, I, would, I would argue that this is, not, this is not overkill, okay? So, this is in a demo app uh, that we use internally at our company that we um, have made available online on GitHub. And, uh, you know, wh what are these 10 layers? Well, one of them is extensions to standard libraries. Uh, we have one that contains uh, domain models and errors. Uh, our UI components that contain strings and uh, widgets, uh, interfaces to APIs, their implementations, uh, modules that represent the clean architecture, uh, our, our actual features, and then the main app target, which handles navigation and launch. So this is all uh, sort of a representation of the clean architecture, which um, uh, I suspect many of you have heard of, perhaps many of you deploy these different concentric circles. Um, uh, represent different layers in a one-way directional flow. I won't get uh, too deep into it, but um, we, uh, we have deployed this architecture or aspire to deploy this architecture in the clients uh, that we build uh, both on iOS and Android. So, given this, uh, given this 10 layer architecture, how do we use strings in, uh, in, in our app? Well, Strings can only be used in an outer layer package, okay? Features and UI components, only in the outermost layers. Strings can never be used in inner layer components. There are no strings in our view models. There's no strings in our use cases layer or logic layer. Uh, there's no strings in repositories, certainly not in databases. And our view models will return domain-specific uh, structs or, or enums uh, or potentially errors, and then the outer layer will attach an extension to one of these uh, and provide the necessary localized string. Okay, so given this architecture that I've just proposed to you all, um, you've, you can imagine, I'm sure many of you have typed uh, a, a line like this, you know, thousands of times, all right? But um, there are two problems. There's two problems with this line. Uh, the first is that um, this snake cased string key name, it's basically like a namespace. Okay? It's, like a, it's like a poor man's namespace. And um, you've heard me say this already, but 
what if this key can't be found? In this case, the UI error would have a title that would be a snake cased string. So it is 2022. How do we solve this problem? Code generation. Code generation, a command line program similar to gen strings uh, that you manually run to convert a set of static assets, strings, but also images, uh, into native Swift source code uh, that enables you to reference these assets in code. Um, and I hate to say it, please, please don't boo, but uh, Android actually figured this out in like 2008. Uh, they have something called an R file, um, and whatever is a good idea, and the, the Swift community finally took it. So if you guys already know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't know what I'm talking about, scan this QR code and download this project right now. There are others uh, that do code generation. Whatever you prefer is fine, um, but uh, we particularly have um, uh, enjoyed SwiftGen. Um, and uh, it seems to be pretty popular. So if you use an, a library like this, uh, now when you type your strings, you will get easy namespacing off of the root class, this L10n root class. You can see the errors namespace. And uh, the compiler also knows uh, that you are, uh, the, the compiler knows what string you're referencing. Okay, so if you were to ever change the name of this string, uh, in the strings file, your app would stop compiling, you'd know it right away, and it will never go missing. So this is awesome, right? Project improved, code cleaned up. Um, but, 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 we have some additional considerations for Swift UI. Uh, so do you know what is happening with this very simple piece of Swift UI code? Okay. Hello world. Uh, it looks like a string. That is not a string. That is not a string, a common misconception. It is a localized string key, OK? And there is an implied NS localized string call that is happening when you use a, uh, a text view in Swift UI. Um, so, uh, if you were to type this line, okay, if you were to, to open up a new project uh, and paste that in, um, this would work, okay? This would, this would be fine for you, um, but you would be doing two layers of localization, okay? You'd be, local, you'd be looking up the translation for Hello World, and then that text component would look it up a second time, and it would probably fail, but the user would never know, okay? You would never realize that there's a problem, and so maybe it's fine. Um, uh, but, 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 if you were to take the output of what you are given um, out of the box by Swift Gen, okay, and pass it to a Swift UI component, a, a text view, um, that is like literally the same line as above, and so you would be doing two, uh, two layers of localization, which is unnecessary. So, you know, what's the big deal? All right, my users can't tell. Um, well, this is the big deal. Okay, your preview does not localize, all right? So uh, as I hope many of you, all of you know, um, in Swift UI uh, uh, previews, you can change the language. And uh, you can see us doing that here, but it still says loading. Uh, and uh, the workaround, the workaround for this is that SwiftGen enables you to extend the code that it generates with something called a stencil. Um, so this solution comes to, uh, comes to us uh, via a comment left in a GitHub thread uh, by a um, very popular open source author. author. His name is Chris Bollinger. Um, we've actually worked with him uh, in the past. And anyway, um, if you take this very helpful suggestion uh, your Swift UI preview will now localize. Okay, you can change the language. Uh, this 
extension will provide you a new member um, that will give you a fully uh, translatable, uh, fully localized text view in your previews. So, in conclusion, <laughs> uh, I would submit everyone here should do this today, right now, immediately. Uh, put all your strings into a standalone Swift package, okay? Uh, then put your Swift UIs into a standalone package. Uh, and then use SwiftGen or any code generation source, uh, uh, code generation tool that you like, um, so that you can get Swift UI preview compatibility for all of the languages that you uh, might want to support. And finally, chaos. Uh, so I told you that our company loves to talk about architecture. Um, I think one of the big benefits of coming to conferences like this one is that we all as developers get to take uh, a big step back, uh, take some time out of our day, and think about architecture. Um, so let's talk about architecture. And I'm going to leave you with four very controversial thoughts, OK? Dependency injection is a must for all mobile applications. OK, we use Sw Swinject. If you don't know what this is, look it up immediately. Second one, if you use dependency injection and test schedulers, you cannot have a flaky test. Uh, we, uh, we use a library called Combined Schedulers. Um, it's published by uh, a group called Point Free. There's some chatter about them in the uh, Slack channel, too. So uh, look it up. Their test scheduler is great. XCTest is a code smell, and all tests should be written in BDD using Quick or Quick and Nimble. Um, the amount of boilerplate and test setup that is required using classic XC test is painful. And uh, we have been uh, rewriting our tests in Quick for many years now to great effect. Um, we also, I'm very proud to say, just submitted a pull request that was accepted to the Quick project a few months ago, and we have a blog post about that. And then finally, um, and this maybe makes us an outlier. I haven't heard of many companies in the world that uh, have this as a philosophy, but our company aims for 100% code parity between iOS and Android. The same classes, the same variable names, the same method signatures, and yes, that includes the UI layer. Jetpack Compose, Swift UI uh, can uh, achieve a tremendous amount of alignment. So you can see all of this in action. Uh, this is our demo app. This shows our 10-layer uh, architecture. Um, and uh, this kind of, we use this internally to explore different architectures and communicate with each other. And we have a parallel app that we also built uh, on Android that we will be releasing soon. This, this, uh, this link also actually has the uh, Swin, uh, uh, Swin, Swift Gen, I want to say Swin Jack, Swift Gen templates. Uh, that you might want if you're going to use it in Swift UI. And that's all I got. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Eric. Great talk. Uh, we have some questions for you. <laughs> Great. Uh, when you put the uh, .strings file into a Swift package, we lost the ability to export them into uh, and xlog files along with the other strings. Any advice for that? The ability to export them to, a, you mean to legacy like Objective C? Yes, I think. Yeah, so. exactly. So um, we have a um, uh, we have a helper class basically that provides a bridge between the new the strings that have been moved and our legacy Objective C. So yeah, it's. That is one of the challenges you, you would face if you move them. It's also, possible, um, it's also possible to do it in pieces, right? You don't, if, if you're building new um, features in Swift, in, in Swift, Swift UI, just put your new strings in the new file, keep them in two places until you're ready to do the big, uh, the big migration. OK, cool. Daniela asks, uh, with code generation like that, uh, must you have all the strings before implementing? Or do you just develop with static strings and then add the location part? 
uh, you, you, you do not need to have everything uh, ready with code generation. Uh, it's, you can add one string at a time, and you don't need all the translations uh, available to you to start development. So it does, the code generation, uh, the code generation does not, uh, as best I can recall, tell you if there is a missing translation. Um, but it will tell you if you've changed the key name in, a, in such a way that it can no longer be found. OK. And the last one, how do you synchronize code parity with Android devs? Uh, pairing. So the, 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 best, uh, the best approach, the best answer I can give is pairing. We pair iOS devs and Android devs. My team will nod their head uh, because I'm always asking, what did the Android team do? Uh, when we do code reviews on new features, a code review is literally, here's the Kotlin implementation, here's the Swift Im implementation, start at the top and read down, okay? Are they the same? And uh, when you are, I, I would argue, certainly starting at the view model layer down, uh, there is, um, there's no reason why you can't achieve that level of parity. Now, we do, use um, reactive libraries, okay? So we use Rx uh, Java. Um, we used Reactive Swift, and today we're on Combine. That has made it a lot easier. Um, the uh, uh, Android world has um, uh, taken a departure to a degree with coroutines. We have um, uh, async tasks now um, on, in, in Swift. Um, so we'll definitely want to explore that more in the future. But um, thus far, over the past several years, we've been able to um, get uh, a high degree of parity across the two, the two platforms. Okay. Thank you so much.